Welcome to episode 112 of the English Stream. I'm Aiden, and this week I am joined by Kevin. We are two artists, illustrators, filmmakers, and all round shit talkers, and each week we take some of the endless stream of content brought to you through Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, Spotify, Disney Plus, YouTube. Wherever you get your content, we take a chunk of it, we watch it, and we talk about it. This week we are talking about some X-Men comics, we are talking about some movie and nerd news, we're talking about my trip to New Orleans, and we are talking about the M. Night Shyamalan film, Knock at the Cabin. If you like what you hear, please consider subscribing to the podcast, heading over to iTunes and Spotify, liking, subscribing, rating, and reviewing. All of those good things really help us out. On top of that, you can head over to Instagram, where we have art and posts to go with every episode, at The Endless Cast. That's a great place to get in touch, send us messages, suggest something for us to watch, disagree with our opinions, basically just engage with us there. On top of that, you can send us an email at theendlesscast at gmail.com. All of that being said, let's get into the episode. For all those listening, this is actually our second try. We recorded the first episode perfectly and it was, I would say it was probably one of our best episodes we've ever recorded, but uh, it it fucked up, so now we have to re-record Sorry, guys. I've really let standards slip since um, since I uh, became an unprofessional, loutish, uh, drunken scumbag. Unprofessional? I'd say just. I'd say that's probably the wrong word. I'd Kev, say unemployed. Kev, Kev's, all of this is Kevin's review, so yeah. Unfortunately, we were unable to get an episode out last week. We tried. Uh, life gets in the way. So sorry about that, folks. Um, we're having a little bit of like um, a little bit of irregularity, but like here's the thing: we've been doing it two years, and we've been rock solid for so much of it. So like, give us a little slack, folks. Give us a little slack. Yes, all of our routines have changed immensely in the last couple of months. I'd say, really. Yeah, and that's what you want in human beings: is growth, right? Uh, there's been a lot. Of, yeah, there's been. A, yeah, exactly. There's been a lot of change, endless stream wise, and uh, we are doing our best to give you, yeah, a show. Yeah. Weekly, no, we're not doing too bad. Mostly, it's mostly your fault, Daniel, because you are the person who created this time shift. Sorry about that. Anomaly. Yeah, again, it's the Chicago cast with Aiden. Yes, yes. Speaking of Chicago, how is it? It's getting hot here now. I'm down in my little basement oh, yeah. apartment. Oh yeah, and what's, what's Chris is up in his in his, his penthouse mm-hmm. suite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can, I can, I can feel the resentment. That no, you no, no, no. I love, I love my spot. Like it's great, and I say it that way simply because oh, um, it's so much cooler down here. It's so much cooler in the basement. Oh, really? I'd kick out of it was my house, but that's it. That's it. But that's me. I kick out just for house. for talking smack about his height. Just for being, we're playing D and D tonight, and I have never played D and D. Oh, oh! I'm so excited um, for you. Jealous. So I've had to be like, I've had to make a character, um, which is fun doing the whole thing. And like, Chris has the book, and I'm reading all the ups and downs. Go on, tell me about your character. Can you can you do Do you want to try that without you on? Sorry, sorry. Uh, go on, tell me about your character. Can you do I can. Yeah, I, it, it's fun. Like it's like I haven't put a lot of characterization into them yet, but it's just trying to find like, like I chose a, a half work. Because I too am big and blundering. Um, a half yeah. orc. Interesting. So your parents were one was human, one was. I orc. guess. Yeah, I didn't really think that put too much thought into that. I haven't written backstory to the point that the parents exist yet. I'm working on it. I was. I'm just interested to know, like, like female orc, her human father, human mother. Male orc, what? What do you? What did you? What do you perceive? Oh, you know as? how it is when those human females get orc fever. Oh, really? You've seen, you've seen Shrek, right? No. Um. Plus, he's an ogre. Oh shit! Not an orc, different. So, different. Like that's. I I yeah, I, that's, I that's hate kind to. Of this, you're, you're kind of you're showing your apologies. Ignorance there. Apologies. I'm basically basing this character on how I play Call of Duty Warzone, which is uh, recklessly, and without any real sense mm-hmm. of where I am. But with a an idea that I'm trying to do complicated things, so he's a rogue because he's got like agendas and goals, but he's um, uh, bad at them. And because I always get lost, and the ongoing refrain from people playing Call of Duty with me is uh, "check your mini map." I have uh, mm-hmm. I have done a little Google Translate, so my half orc's name is called Tark. But okay. that is short for Tarkista Minikartazi, which is Finnish for check your minimap. Oh, amazing. 
Amazing. I thought you didn't put much work into I this. I didn't take a lot of time to put uh, check your mini map into Google Translate <laughs> and then just switch through all the languages until I found one that looked pronounceable and kind of fun D and D ish. And and or. Oh, I know, yeah, yeah, D and D orcish. Um, so what's the proper? So when you said you got the manual or booklet to to create a character. What's what's the kind of general? Uh, like what's the what are the parameters? Like how does it start? I mean, work? you can go and buy that book, and I think Brian said he had, didn't he? Brian bought with D and D for the podcast at one stage. Oh, I bought Elden Ring actually. So we okay, we got to schedule those play sessions. That. Maybe maybe when you're back yeah. or something. The the book is fun, like like the D and D book. It's it's a lot of reading to to load a lot of information into you. You know, so like races, classes, skill sets. Like you're you're just kind of like learning. You know, each of the things. So first, the different species, the races, or, then the certain roles that you can fill into, then the sort of characterization stuff. So the, a lot of the book that I've touched on so far is around building those characters but at the end of the day just time being an issue i just went to the D D website and they've got a little character builder and the little reading i did in the book helped lay a foundation and like i want to go back and read more of it but it, there is so much depth to it like there's 60 70 80 pages of like putting characters together and it's like, okay i'm i don't have time to read all that stuff um but what i can do is play with the the character builder online and even then, that's a, kind of got a, a depth to it that's tricky as yeah. well. But all that is to say, this evening, I'm going over with Chris to some mates, and we're going to play a one-shot, which is a one-day adventure, um, rather than like a two-year campaign. So, going to be fun. Yeah, that sounds great. Sounds like good, really, really good fun. Uh, I'm not jealous of you at all. But uh, so, you, you can do the first thing. Continuing you in can, that vein. You, well, you can cut your teeth on it, and then uh, we can get brian's stuff and do uh uh endless stream D D campaign cool i'd love it i'd love it we we might talk to like the hearth fire tales pod guys and see if they have any tips we might get them on and like get an instructional off them um because i used to train with those boys oh cool i'm not aware of it but um, I'm not, Oh, um, well, check check them out. It's a good podcast. Um, I haven't spoken to them in ages, so they're unaware that I'm saying this. Um, but we used to do some free running stuff. You used to do some real life campaigns yourselves, huh? Any 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 news from Dublin? What's the crack? What's the politics? Is, is do we, who's the Taoiseach right now? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. It's either Lee Michal Martin or Leo Vadker. Uh, interchangeable to say the least, and more than likely fucking it up. Um, I was in Brian's fair city of Cork last weekend for a stag for a buddy of mine who's getting married in two weeks time and it was great fun Cork is a great fucking city it's awesome love Cork oh, I love great. Cork what did, what did you get up to? Uh, we, we took a boat ride f- uh, from Cork City out to Cove where we kind of went for a drink around there and then back on the boat into this city and uh, so we took a boat ride out from Cove to, uh, and back to Cork. Then we played kind of, it was a really good, it was like 24, it was quite a big stag. Uh, but we played uh, kind of like a, 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 a type of darts. Uh, you kind of go down there and they have these like kind of like, uh, basically it's like, it's all, I would say it's like it starts with real board and real darts, but it's, there's like a virtual aspect to it where like there's different types of games to play and stuff. Uh, and it's all prompted and things. But it's 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 like it's like basically, if you hit like say a bullseye, for example, one of the games would have towers like Jenga. Each person would have their own tower. The more uh, the higher number you hit, the more blocks would come down from your tower. And the idea is who can break their tower down the fastest in the least number of shots. You know, uh, there's mm. games where everybody gets assigned three numbers, and you can take each other out, eliminate each other, get extra lives and bonus points and all that kind of stuff. But it's just darts. It's literally just standing in the pub throwing darts. But it's just like like it has like a screen above it and a kind of a touch screen beside it. As a, it's like really really good. Did that then upon cool. Brian's recommendation, we went to the Impala where we spent the rest of our evening having drinks and having chats and it was great to catch up with lads that I went to secondary school with uh, great to catch up with some really close friends and uh, yeah phenomenal couldn't have asked for more from Cork it was great uh, we did get delayed an hour and a half on our train um, back to Dublin some poor unfortunate had a medical emergency and we had to wait for the ambulance to get to the train which was quite 
you know, shocking to say the least. But, uh, you know, and I hope that person's okay. But, uh, yeah, that was it. Pretty good weekend. As obviously, aside from that poor person's medical emergency. But it was great. Really, really enjoyed it. Yes. <laughs> I don't know who that was. We were but bets were, on whether they lived or died. No, no, they were a young person. It was on a carriage. Uh, some of the guys saw more than me. but So the odds were in their favor. Yes. Well, please God. But, um, but yeah. Yeah, that was it. Uh, that was last weekend. Uh, as for Dublin, same old, same old, me amigo. Um, I don't think I did anything particularly. House prices are crazy. House prices are still crazy. Supermarket prices are crazy. Everything's crazy. Um, I don't think, I can't think if I did anything this week. Uh, aside from a few, a few evening walks with the dog and Emer and enjoying the sun and the nice weather. Oh, very good. And I was with Brian last week. Actually, Brian look after a bug for me. Oh. Which is Did great. Brian go up to you there and look yes. after the dog? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you like, you, you mad hattered and changed places. Yes, I know, yeah. He came up to my house oh, and I went fun. down to his city. Yeah. Huh. But uh, I got to good. hang out with Brian, which is always fun and an honor. Yeah. And a pleasure. Yep. An honor and a pleasure. Yes. Did you play any video games when he was up? Uh, no, to be honest. To? No, he came up uh, late enough on the Friday night where we kind of just got food and chatted away and stuff. And then by the time I, I with with the poor unfortunate person having their medical emergency and all that kind of stuff, by the time I got up, uh, it was much later than I actually thought we would be. You know? Um, so we just went out for dinner and then Brian moseyed on back to Cork. God bless him. Though he had a busy weekend in Dublin with Bjog. He, he did a great job looking after her. She's here beside me now, sleeping. Um, But yeah. That's that's pretty much. I don't think I did anything else. Yeah, that was it. But you had it. You had a, a very active week. Yeah, and that's why. Like, I brought the laptop. I brought the microphone. I was like ready to like oh, I'm wake sorry. up and do it. No, 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 no. Don't do that. I was ready to like wake up and do a record from like the road, um, and it didn't line up. But it w- would have been fun, or could have been funny to have me like rolling out of a tent very early in the morning. <laughs> Um, place, we yeah. left, so it was a Memorial Day weekend, and let me see if I can put this in chronological order. Um, so it is about eight hours drive, according to Google Maps, from Chicago to Nashville, and, you know, with stops and getting food and whatever, um, it was probably closer to 10 hours um, by the time we got down there, so we left on... Thursday morning with a, a tent and an air mattress in the back of the car. Drove out of Chicago, um, stopped at a Bass Pro Shop along the way. I kind of, I heard that mentioned on a podcast and was like, that could be funny. Let's check that shit out. And it's like an outdoor fish shop. It's Bass is in the name, or as Chris calls it, Bass Pro Shop. No, yeah, yeah. fishing shop, shooting shops, camping shop. Um, you know, you can buy guns, bows and arrows. Uh, you walk into the place, it's Man, it's fucking enormous. There's a waterfall in the place. There's an aeroplane hung from the ceiling. You can buy boats. You can buy uh, granola. You can buy archery equipment, fishing equipment. It's just, it's one of these sort of massive American concepts. Stick everything under a roof of a square kilometer of real estate. Like it's, it's enormous. Mm. Um, when we came back and I'll share a photo with you, um, when we were coming back, um, I wonder, can I just share that now? Um, we got distracted by something on the side of the road. There was a giant silver pyramid oh, wow. coming out of Memphis. And we were like, wow, that's really crazy looking. Like, there's a there's a pyramid there, you know? What is that? And as we sort of got to the other side of it, it just said Bass Pro Shop on the side of it. It's like, holy oh my God. God. An, oh, my God. Jesus. Um, they the it was enormous. This stuff. Yeah. And uh, the only thing, the, the only reason we could draw... We were like, why build a fucking pyramid? And it was in Memphis. Now, Memphis was a ancient Egyptian city, right? Yes, yes. Famous so that's the, uh, that's the only uh, connection I can get famous, to as to why they would build a pyramid. Yeah, it's a famous holiday home of Cleopatra. <laughs> so we, we got to Nashville, and um, I took some video and stuff. I will, I will send it on to you, because uh, I was thinking of you with the, um, the honky-tonks. I know, I'd um, love it. I'd love it. I had jambalaya last night. It was great. Go on. I, d- I mean, I don't know. We did, we went to Nashville. We went to Broadway, which is their street, you know, mm-hmm. which is their like strip. Yep. Um, And, you know, we, we enjoyed looking at it. 
And then we found the quietest bar we possibly could on the whole strip and went up to the roof bar where there was nobody but a bartender. And we had a drink with him and we talked some shit for a while and he was very nice and friendly and we had a nice look over the sky or over the city. And after chatting for a bit, he went, actually, I live about a mile that way. And if you were really looking for like a decent bar to hang out in, here are four suggestions. Very good. And we went, that's exactly. Um, So we left there and walked across uh, Nashville. And found a couple other pubs. They were good fun. And it wasn't until we were in one of them that Chris went, oh, I've been here before. Like, I think his phone even was like no way. six years ago today you were at this no spot. Way. And now he recognized it when he got there, you know, like it's not yeah. um, misrepresenting it at all. But it's just like some of the things we're doing, Chris has done before or we been to before and we're doing different things in it. Um, my concept on these trips is always try and do a thing and then have a party you know what i mean don't yeah. just drive in and get pissed fair um but we were we picked up an app called hip camp which tells you where you can kind of camp That's around awesome. america so you just yeah, drive yeah. in and pick a location and we just drove up into somebody's field um and it was funny um because the guy's like on a, the guy the guy's on like a ride on mower in this field around a farmhouse thing and we roll in in Chris's old squad car, like black and white. And he pulls up beside us and Chris stares down the window and just goes, how's it going? I'm here to this, that and the other. And there's this moment's silence. And he goes, no, I'm here to like, we, we've made a booking. So we're just wondering, do we pull around this side? Or we pull around this side? And the guy's looking at us and it took a real moment before he went, these aren't actually police officers. Like there was a, there was a real moment where he like, I had to like, it took a moment for him to go, Actually, not police. Can't talk to them. I understand what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we camped out in the field at the back with a whole lot of goats and That's cats great. and dogs. It was funny coming back to that because uh, the dogs were in with the goats and they were like, you know, guard dogs to a degree, you know, just making sure nothing gets in there. Yeah. And it was funny coming back to that in the middle of the night because they were just like backlit goats staring at us. It was kind of creepy in the pitch blackness. And... Then we rolled on to New Orleans uh, the next day, which was another 10 hours of driving. We found a, we had a good hostel booked because we knew we were going to be there a few days. We wanted somewhere that was mm-hmm. a bit more a bit more um, comfortable. And it was cool. The city looks great. Like the, the architecture is amazing. I don't know. The hostel was good. It felt, felt like they'd bought a block of houses. And like you go into one house and then suddenly you're in the back garden and they've knocked down all the fences and you're just oh, going wow. into these different houses on the way. So it was kind of funky. Um, we did, we walked up Bourbon Street. Mm-hmm. Um, again, found the quietest bar because, and then started going for like bars off Bourbon Street because like it is chaos. It is absolute. Oh, so like you would, I, Memorial Weekend, is it? Yeah. But I think, I think Bourbon Street kind of is that. To a degree, you know, it's just the party street, like it's going to Temple Bar on a weekend. Yeah. You know, it's whatever. Um, We drove just to outside Tennessee because I think we did like five, six, seven hours driving. Um, camped in a field again. Good fun. Next day we went to see Graceland, um, which was amazing. And when I get to these points of like true Americana, I am thinking of you and and how much you love this stuff as well. I really did think, I, I was unsure whether or not I would be, like, disappointed with Graceland, whether it would be, I don't know what I thought it could have been, um, but it was great. It was really, really good. Um, if you're an Elvis fan, uh, you know, you arrive at the location, you buy a ticket, it's like $80 with the tax included. Um, they stick you in a shuttle bus and drive you over to the mansion. You get a tour through it. The tour is a little... It's a little restrictive, but you can kind of understand to some degree they got to control numbers. Um, and, you know, it is um, it is a house of the 70s. Like, it's not a big yeah. palatial 90s, 2000s millionaire's mansion. You know, you look, at a, you look at a drawing room, you look at a dining room, you look at a kitchen. There's a den in the basement. There's a den in the back of the house. You don't go upstairs, but that's it. Like, it's not palatial you, you go out back you see the little office they've got um he built a racquetball court he had a place to ride horses like when people think of mansions it's definitely you know an old definition of a mansion as opposed to 
you know, owning a fucking. I know what you're saying pal- palatial hotel. You know, it's a, it's a lovely home, a lovely home. Um, Who lives in a home like this? And then they drive you back across the road, and they've got this whole museum set up. You know, and you're just sort of like the cars of Elvis, the costumes of Elvis, the archives of all the things that he did. You know, like his his impact on music history. Um, there's a whole lot of costumes from people that were like inspired by Elvis. Um, you know, people wearing similar sort of jumpsuits type of stuff, and those are there. Uh, did I send you the picture of the Rock? Yes. Um, when he did Rock the Troops, and he's wearing a full-on Elvis costume. Um, it's very silly. Um, uh, nothing silly when you believe in exactly. magic. Oh my God, my uh, back. Yeah. <laughs> Then we, um, yeah, then we just, like, we packed up, got in the car. We started at 7 a.m. that morning. I drove until probably 5. Got us to St. Louis. And we went to see the Arch. Now, you're aware the, the, the gateway to the west, the, the St. Louis Arch. I've yeah. seen it, yes. Yeah. It's kind of astounding. Okay. We got a beautiful day for it. I have an image in my head of that arch. I think I had it in my head. It was somewhere like the spire in height. Mm-hmm. And it is not. It is oh. huge. Oh, I was literally going to liken to the spire. It's bigger than the spire, is it? Ten times as tall. It is. Wow. It is. Uh, and the day we got for it. Like, it was a beautiful day. There was a little haze of it. It was sci-fi territory type of things. You yeah, know, you sure. See, like Simon Stalinhog art, and, yeah. and there's like, like normal residential stuff going on, and then this giant but structure. It, but uh, even when it's, you text me, I said Halo. I don't know if you're familiar with the Halo games. Halo, but, yeah. yeah. It's it's a it's enormous. It is enormous, and the simplicity of the materials, the the three sides of steel or whatever the con the the skin of it is, gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. It looked great. If you pick the right angle on it you're looking straight into st louis with like town hall and stuff down the middle a courthouse or whatever absolutely absolutely gorgeous <laughs> you're all right yes yeah yeah fine you look like you're hanging and about to throw up no. i know you're just like tired and warm or something but like you look like death it's been a long day okay it's, it's five o'clock we drove back and we got back to chicago around midnight and absolutely shattered and um chris was driving that back leg and we were just sort of we were blasting that tenacious d album just singing that loudly on the highways coming back into chicago yeah epic uh, which was good fun and it was just a great end to a, a a good week week away i guess six days of absolute fucking chaos yeah bring um, man well, not even chaos it was like that paints it too no ruckus. six days of well structured ruckus Sure. I watched a movie this week that I don't know. Had you seen it already, or did you watch it upon my recommendation? Or I hadn't seen it. I watched it on your recommendation. I had been told mm. kind of the end of it. Oh, like there was no doubt for me as to what was going on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it was very good to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, I really enjoyed it. So, do, uh, do you want to talk about it a bit? So the movie is the latest movie from M. Night Shalaman, and it's Knock at the Cabin in the Woods. Is it? What's the name of it? Knock at the Cabin. Knock at the Cabin. Yeah. I keep on saying In the Woods. That's a different movie. Knock, Knock at, the, at cabin. the Cabin in the Woods yeah. by M Night Shalaman. That w- that would not be a good title for a movie. Knock at the Cabin with Dave Batista uh, and, and Rupert pl- Grint. Yes, a plethora and of Jonathan Groff. Yes, Jonathan Groff. He he was one of the fathers, wasn't he? Yep. What else is he and in? He was a villain in uh, No Time to Die, and he played King George in Hamilton. I think he was in Glee. Yeah. If I go back far enough, yeah, this is, I recognize um, him from stuff, and he is brilliant. But he's very uh, good. He's got great uh, range, but he does it from a position of being a very generic-looking white man. So it's kind of yes. hard to um, get his get him to stick in my brain. You know, there's nothing. Yeah, yeah, fair. But uh, the movie though itself, I mm. thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Fucking Batista's performance in it was wild. He's so what's very, the very good. So the premise of the movie is a couple and their daughter are holidaying in a cabin in the woods. Um, 
when uh, the young girl is playing outside the house and she's approached by Dave Batista, who is playing a character called Leonard, I believe. And mm. he's kind of just, you know, they have a they have a back and a forth and blah, blah. But the child runs into the house to warn her parents that there's someone outside and there's more people coming or something. And then the family, the, the, two, the two fathers and the child. Well, well, now, are, now you're describing the order of scenes, but like, Family in the woods. Family in the woods. Are, Four people show up. Yes, and are propositioned. And the proposition is? They have to kill... They have to decide for someone... One of them to die and they have to kill them. In order to save the world. Right. So one of the three family members must die. Andrew, Eric, and one of the family members. One of the family members themselves must kill the other. Yes. And, and as the, far as we know, these are lunatics... These are some sort of death cult, some sort of suicide cult. It's played very straightly and the conversation all seems very reasonable, but the content of the conversations are lunatic. Yeah, yeah. Um, a great movie. Really, really good movie. I totally enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, very tense, almost mm-hmm. like I, I do like those like one room kind of things as well, where it's like this could have been a play. Yeah. Almost, yeah, do you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'd love to see a play of it. The, I mean, sorry, I, I feel like I cut you off. Bautista, you liked his performance? Oh yeah, I think he was brilliant in it. Absolutely brilliant in it, you know. And um, I really think he, like, I think Bautista has really shown his acting chops, you know, uh, in movies that in, in in more recent movies and stuff. I think, uh, like, you know, quite often when someone transitions from wrestling to acting, they're when someone transitions to wrestling to acting, they're very much kind of get typecast and stuff, you know, whereas they, they try, they're compared to the likes of The Rock and stuff, where I think Batista's on a different level. Batista has acting chops, proper acting chops. Yeah, and, and Batista has spoken about this a wee bit um, as well, where he talks about not wanting to play, uh, you know, action heroes so much as he wants to play interesting and diverse range of characters. Yeah. And I think... I saw that first in, like, before it was even writ large, um, in Blade Runner 2049. Yes. He's in it for three, four minutes, but he takes this role of this this hulking tank replicant and makes it so small, you know, just wearing his glasses and, and cooking his little protein meal and just wanting to be left alone and eventually having to turn on the, the, the combat mode. But he he's doing great like knock at the cabin is such a a great showcase for him to show yeah. somebody driven by driven by what a, a, a like a very clear emotion and conflicted by what he feels he has to do and showing empathy for the people he's put in this situation um I think he did mm. a fantastic job. M. Night Shyamalan went through a period of being kind of ridiculed, right? Like the lady in the water, Avatar, the last airbender. I don't know um, if the lady in the water got ridiculed as much as the likes of Avatar and the happening. The lady in the water, it was a colossal flop. Oh, was it? I don't, it was I don't remember it, to be it, honest. It was a big flop and... I remember it at the time because he wanted complete control, as I remember, of the films, like production or narrative. And he, I don't know that he distributed it himself, but he, he shifted a contract and went somewhere else to do the movie. Like there was some fuckery, some fuckery. And what I remember is he wrote a book around the same time called something on the lines of how M. Night Shyamalan, or how I, uh, uh, bet my career on a fairy tale and won. Mm. And the joke at the time was, nobody didn't. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, the title of the book basically talked about how great a success this film was. But he did it before he released the film and saw that it was a flop. You know? Um, And so... Avatar, the airbender thing was like his step back to try and redeem himself by doing something that was a 
seemed like a kind of run-of-the-mill franchise movie rather than one of his yeah. self-authored narratives. The happening then was a lunatic. I don't know. I, I didn't even see the happening so much as I saw the, the clips of it where you know, the grass is killing everybody and Mark Wahlberg is like, what? No. Why don't you say that? Um, it's Wahlberg, right? Yes, close enough. Um, but has... Shyamalan redeemed himself. Is he um, back? Is he has his career sort of leveled out to the point that it's working? No, I could be wrong. But did he did he do the visit? Did he direct that as well? The visit. I think. I think. I think his What's career. What's the visit? Uh, it's two kids go to uh, rural America to visit their grandparents. Oh God! I'm just. I'm going to pull up his his IMDb, and I'm going to tell you. As much as I feel like he is working successfully, I don't like these things. <laughs> Fair. Old. I watched it. Uh, mm. Um, What was my takeaway? Sorry, you go ahead. I was going to say I watched it because, you know, I, I can say it because I watched it. Um, mm. Yeah, like, kind of like, a, a lot of it very, like, very interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff. And I don't even think I hated the ending as such. But, uh, but uh, kind of a strong, maybe six, 6.5. Okay, I'm going to give you the directing IMDb of M. Night Shyamalan and we'll go film by film and you can give it a say thumbs up thumbs down okay I'll accept a thumbs middling as well The Sixth Sense uh, this this is is this his entire career or just yeah of what he directed it's not it's directed he directed The Sixth Sense um, I'm gonna go through it you're gonna give me the thumbs up don't know what you're looking okay. at okay okay oh sorry I'm looking at something else uh, go on the Sixth Sense. Yes. Uh, thumbs up. Unbreakable. Thumbs up. Massive thumbs I love thumbs I loved that movie back in the day. Yeah. It was it was two thousand. It was some of the only comic book content we could get. Yep. It was a superhero that wasn't Batman and Robin. Mm-hmm. You know, we barely had Spider Man, we barely had X Men at that point. X Men I think was two thousand and one, maybe. Yeah. Um, so this might have been the first superhero content we had for a while, and we had Alex Ross doing character illustrations for it, if you remember. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Science. Uh, so, yeah, thumbs up for Sixth Sense, Unbreakable. Science, thumbs up, man. I love some, I love that movie. Science is great. Science is great. The Village? Uh, I didn't see it, and it was spoiled on me, so uh, thumbs down, but not, uh, not that, that's just kind of a... Hmm. I, that's kind of like, I can't really say anything about that one. Yeah, I kind of enjoyed it, but it was the first sort of middling. I was kind of proud of myself that, like, I saw the trailer and called the twist. I was proud of myself. Um, Lady in the Water? Uh, I don't think either of us have seen it. Don't think I've seen it. it. Don't think I've seen it. I can't remember. Don't think I've seen it. Uh, Yeah. The Happening? Has to be a thumbs down. Cool premise and some kind of really eerie and creepy moments and all that kind of stuff. But uh, Mm. the the conclusion is, uh, is poor. The conclusion is so poor. the uh yeah so lady in the water was a flop i know that uh the happening also a flop and that's where we get to the i need to build back some commercial clout in this filmmaking process and that is when you get the last airbender in 2010 and after earth with will and jaden smith in 2013 did you see either of those? I've never seen The Last Airbender because I was told how bad it was, so I never saw it. And I tried to watch uh, After Earth. But by I guess by 2013, I was less enamored by Will Smith and stuff. And I certainly wasn't, wasn't interested in Jaden even back then. Yeah. It's interesting to think that, that like the sort of the low phase of Will Smith's career. Mm-hmm is in effect in 2013. That's a decade. Mm. Um, okay, we got some TV stuff. The Wayward Pines, he directed an episode. Um, the Visit. So I liked it. What is that? I don't even know two, what it is. It two, went completely under my radar. Two young kids go to visit their, like I said, go to visit their grandparents uh, in rural America. And uh, it's just like kind of like some, some kind of like eerie stuff starts happening the kids are kind of a little bit you know kind of freaked out by their environment they're skyping their mother the mother couldn't um the mother was meant to go with them or something but she couldn't so uh the kids had to end up going out by themselves 
Right. Did you? Yeah, we talked about this a bit before. I think where you may have said that the grand, like, eventually they get a phone call and they're like, "That's not your grandmother." Yeah. Yeah. Now, kind of <laughs> be careful. Like yeah, because you it, like M. I. Shadowman's movies are all about the twist. You know. Right. Um. I think the visit was strong from him. And then I think things started looking better for him when he did Split. That's the turnaround, isn't it? Yeah. Split is where people started to go, actually, maybe he's not terrible. Yeah, Split and Glass. Um, split, then Glass. Because he tried to see, uh, which, kind of, he was doing like a kind of like a M.I. Shadowman universe thing. Yes. The night first. Then old. So what are we saying? Uh, thumbs up for the visit. Thumbs up for the visit, for sure. Thumbs Thumb, up for Split. Thumbs up for Split. Um, glass? glass was only okay. Right. Old? Uh, it was entertaining. Thumbs up. But like, Thumbs you know, I'm, I'm sure some people might hate it. Look, to be honest, I for some reason, I, I can't remember it. Even though I watched it, I can't remember enough about it to, 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 you know. I remember the movie. I just can't remember how I felt about it. Right. I, yeah, I, I don't think that got great reviews. Um. But is Rufus Sewell in there? Oh, it is. It is Rufus Sewell. I like him. Um, and then it's Knock at the Cabin, which is a massive thumbs up. Yeah, it was. It's it's great. It's small. There is some dodgy CG in it. Yeah, but um, yeah, it has its sort of big moments. But there's good doubt as to what's going on in places and like, like. Is there cause and effect based on what's going on? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, the, it, it does... Um, like, it makes it doubt the scenario, but then it also makes it like, could it? You know, it's good. And it's the it's the kind of sweet spot side of, like, 90 minutes. Yes. Like, it's not two and a half hours long. It's I did watch it, though, in two cents. Hour 10. Or, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm exhausted, man, these days. We're not going to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I guess the question is then, with all of that in review, yes, uh, how do we feel about Shyamalan? Um, I think three. four, five, six, seven. I feel like we've got seven out of nineteen. Got a thumbs up there. I think seven out of nineteen is better than. You know, that's I I know people probably think that's a terrible track record, but it's actually kind of not. You know what I mean? Like uh, to produce seven good films in a lifetime is is you know obviously you make enough of them you're gonna kind of get you're gonna hit the mark sometimes you know, but yeah. uh, put it this way: when I'm uh, Shadow Man releases a movie, does it does it ping on my radar? It does. <laughs> I, I just what? heard you say. When Ant Man and the Shadow Man releases, I was like Ant Man and the no, Shadow Man. M Night Shadow Man. I said. Wait, Shyamalan. Wait, what, what is his name? Shala- Shyamalan. 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 I'm going to M. Knight. Shyamalan. Yeah. Fair. Now, yeah. Th- those are the syllables you're aiming at. They do get pronounced, pronounced, pronounced. Um, slightly differently. Um, but Shyamalan is hilarious. Shyamalan. Sh- uh, M. Knight. Well, all I was going to say is when he does bring out a movie. It mm. does ping summer on my radar, and I'm always yep. probably intrigued enough to go see it. You know, he did it. Like, it's like kind of like it's a sixth sense, unbreakable, and signs is a fucking strong, strong start. You know, uh, ultimately. So uh, and like you know, he then he has strong movies in the middle, and the last movie was really, really good as well. You should only really be judging your last. You know, you, we we kind of say sometimes you're only ever judging your last of two. You know. It's like you're only ever judging your last thing. It's like kind of all that experiences came up to a point to make that thing, you know? Sure, sure. That that's that's a double edged sword. That one though, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Like if it, but it is because if you're if you do it like my if I did my last two or my, if my last two wasn't a particularly good one or wasn't a successful one or something like that, it's just like well, kind of like that just shows you you have more to fucking learn. It doesn't matter if you did ten great ones last week, like. There's an example of something you need to work on. There's a, there's something there that you need to you need to improve on. You know, sure. You're like no. okay. Well, I, I just like um, I've only ever heard that version of that expression of like you're only as good as your last film or your last piece or whatever. I've always heard that as just a kind of negative, and I know it can be interpreted as positive, but like 
and it is and that's what you're doing you're taking the best version of that interpretation but i always i, I go if i've put 20 years of work in and i've done multi-million dollar successful feature films that have like made myself a name made x y and z whatever and you know and i make one shit film and i'm back to square one fucking hell that's cutthroat isn't it you're you're basically you're, you're people would be ridiculous to say you're back to square one it just shows you that you have things to learn yes in the context of tattooing in the context, in the context of, of in the context of, of getting permission to make a billion dollar film uh, you know someone would always probably they won't <laughs> someone's always going to be like look you, you did it once you can do it again you know to a degree yeah to a degree um I, I can't remember who i heard saying it as well it's like you kind of got three chances you know if you make a great hit and then the next one's just all right and then the third one's like not making money they're not going to give you hundreds of millions of dollars they'll try someone else but but that, that that's what that produce uh, production company or studio or whatever doesn't mean your options are completely gone but i know i know i, I know think, what you're saying I, yeah i think this expression is has different con- different uh depending on the different the, interpretations the depending field. on the art yeah 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 fair i get you i get you but uh um, but i would just say you know like it's like you know you know on, on on a smaller scale on a scale that we'd be dealing with on a day-to-day basis you know i think it's like yeah you judge on your last thing to a degree like to a degree you know just because you did one shitty thing as you said doesn't mean like i said it's like to a degree but all i'm saying is like you know if you're not happy with it it's like yeah that's fine because now you know you need to have things to work on yeah i'm trying to think of that like when did martin scorsese make a dog shit film you know the irish man you don't like the irishman well no people it, it doesn't well i i don't necessarily have an issue with it but it doesn't have much favor from a lot of people yeah i mean spielberg's got a bunch as well where it's like if you're judging him on the last thing there was a point where his last thing was not good you know what i mean yeah yeah you know he i'm trying to think the kingdom of the crystal skull horrible horrible we judge him on his last thing except you know shinder's list jurassic park jaws et yeah but you know it just shows you though that even spielberg has things to learn of course they do. everybody right. does every day is a school day you know you watching any television anything on the old netflix yeah i watch a bad sisters on apple tv and it's fucking phenomenal sharon horn i don't know if that's how you pronounce her name but horgan. Um, horgan sharon horgan is just jesus she's one of the best like like i don't know if you watch catastrophe or the way up and things but like the things she writes are phenomenal and bad sisters is so so good so good yeah She's great, and she's just quietly working. I mean, I say quietly, but it's like um, she, she's just been motoring away for the last 10, 15 years, just making great stuff. She's she And she's is, starting to get the credit for it. I think she's she's, she has to be. like I probably said this before in the podcast, but I don't really see any Irish person rivaling her in terms of skill and ability in the entertainment industry. In terms of acting and writing and all that jazz, she's our best. Okay. She's a phenomenal actor. Uh-huh. She's an incredible writer. She's an incredible, like, you know, producer or director. I'm sure she has her hat in many, many, uh, you know. Hat in many heads. What, what's the expression? Many irons in her fire. Many strings to her bow. I don't know. One of them. F- Thumb in many pies. Yes, I want to f- fingers in many pies, but uh, fingers in many pies. Yes, but uh, yeah, but she's brilliant. She is brilliant. And like, have you? I don't know. Have you watched Bad Sisters? I watched the first episode. Uh, it's so good. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I will smudge more of it. Full of nepo babies, but it's good. I hate that fucking expression. That's because you're you you potentially could be a nepo baby. <sighs> <laughs> I like. I'm, I, I, th- I think I heard Bill Burr reacting to that as well <laughs> recently and he was just like fucking leave them alone if they're born into what they're born into if they've got proximity to fucking an industry yeah. yes of course I mean I, I think the line he said I think he said the line he said was my plumbers are 
and sons, you know? What, yeah. that kid should have to go off and start his own company just because his dad's a plumber? But uh, but that's funny that you said that because I literally said to Eva, like, people always throw around the Nepo baby thing. But, like, at the end of the day, though, like, kind of, for every Nepo baby that kind of fails miserably because they got in there from having no talent and having connections to every Nepo baby who fucking, like, earns it. You know what I mean? Like, as in, like, you have to show up. Like, it's not going to get you anywhere. Yeah. Like, you know? listen, as much as Paris Hilton got a lot of shit through the early 2000s, and the the I don't know the teens or whatever, right? If you look at that career, she took a swing at acting. It did not fucking work. She took a swing at music. It did not fucking work. Now whether she's making money, you in should do some you, clothing you, you should or, do a kid's book on that. She took a swing right. at acting. It did not fucking work. But uh, <laughs> but but you know what I'm saying? Like that's a nepo baby with lots of money behind her who's doing media based things and. You know, the reality TV thing dried up at a certain point because it's not a fucking sustainable yeah. thing. The mm. The pursuit of music and acting didn't work because, I don't know, she's not good enough at it or wasn't putting the work into it. Well, she has strength in other things because Paris Hilton's by no means... Uh... But what I'm getting at is, like, what she's doing now is where she's put her effort and work. Like, she is working and like i i don't know whether it's lifestyle brands or fucking like uh she's involved in charities and stuff like she's she's working where she can work yeah like she works but she's not an actress because she tried and the nepo thing didn't work you know what i mean the nepo thing didn't help her yeah yeah but i know you have to be good at it but it was but it was a joke but i did say it to Emer like kind of like it's funny how people do try that thing around like but like like the people in that tv show like they have to show up to work and like they 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 do good like you know what i mean um (laughs) Like, it would only get, it, would, it might open doors for you, but, like, the kind of, like, no one's going to, like, hand it to you either, you know? Yeah, well, that's it. Look at John Romina Jr. Yeah, if he couldn't draw, he wouldn't be in that job. Yeah, I saw, uh, right. I saw, I was 10, but I won't get it. Uh, I, I might have, I what might is have it? some single issues. No, no, it's just, it's just for the artwork alone. Uh, his Daredevil Typhoid Mary story. Right. The artwork is great, but uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get uh, any comics or start reading any comics until we get through Age. Well, I will I will read other ones, but uh, we are we are going to do Age of Apocalypse. Yeah, we we talked about this in the last episode, and I started reading. I guess I got my wires crossed. I read um, X Men Alpha number one from 1995, which I think is Chris Bacello art i used to love his stuff um, when i was younger yeah uh yeah he passed away recently didn't he mm-hmm. Car- am i making that up am i think i'm mixing him up with carlos pacheco pacheco oh maybe yeah yeah but i, I do well i like both of them but yes pacheco was more avengers and the guy that you're talking about was more x-men yeah let me just double check this i have it here i think uh so interior penciler okay i'm way off uh roger cruz okay uh, the inker is Dan Panosian, whose artwork subsequently is fucking stunning. I don't know if you watch his, like, like he does a lot of Copic ink drawings. No. Oh. Um, send me, send me, send me. Send me, him. send me, send me, send me, send me. Absolutely, send me, send me. absolutely stunning. Um, so I think I was supposed to read X-Men Chronicles number one, and I read X-Men Alpha number one. Yeah, you um, see, I said to you that, I said to you that Rob, uh, shout out to Rob in Subsidy, said uh, to read kind of, Alpha first, and then Omega at the end. And you can read anything basically in the middle. But uh, we found, but then you and I found Marvel's reading guide, and that said, uh, Chronicles first. So uh, the thing we should have read has Terry Dodson listed as penciler and Klaus Johnson as inker. Klaus Johnson worked on um, Dark Knight Returns and stuff, right? Am I wrong there? Uh, I'm not too sure. I come to you for your. Uh... Your comic book knowledge. But I'm not a Batman person. Or DC. Yeah, but he's... Okay. Wait, what did you ask me? Klaus Johnson was involved with The Dark Knight Returns, wasn't he? Yes. No, yeah, Klaus. Yes. Yes, he was. I think he was inking Miller's work. Yes, but I think he's inked Miller's work loads. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. And then yeah. Lynn Varley was the colorist. Um, yeah. So... I mean, look, it's out of order, but I will say um, it's fun looking back at 90s artwork to a degree. It is. Um, it's 
computer coloring early days god they loved a gradient oh and a flare uh, the old solar flares as well yeah yeah um it's actually tough i don't know <laughs> There's there's some art styles even like we're going back to the sixties and seventies where it's just like this is dense and I hard know. to wade through. Yeah, yeah. Um this is it's not even dense, it's just ugly in many places. And it's like that's harsh criticism, I guess, but like um I think there's always a phase with new technology where people just go buck wild and it's very garish. What do you think? Yeah, for sure. Um, that's why I kind of I do. There's a part of me that really loves like stuff in the eighties and seventies and stuff. But really, like kind of the particularly like the like yeah the seventies and early eighties and things. The stuff for me that loves that stuff because they didn't have the computers to color at the time. Like they didn't have the, mm-hmm. the, the same the same kind of coloring. Um, nineties. Uh, to be honest, yeah, nineties comic books. Kind of some of the weaker stuff, or sorry, some of, yeah, some of the weaker stuff is basically because it's just overly rendered over the top extreme where even some 90s stuff that's like more Indian on a smaller scale looks completely fine because they just did the same colouring that they did in like the 80s or the 70s like it was very like you know you talk about Hellboy uh, mm-hmm. Hellboy is just 90s I'm pretty sure uh, yeah 90s uh, mostly yeah you know what I mean like so that's, that's what I'm saying like so kind of like uh, Dave Stewart obviously was colouring coloring those books back in the day and we're all aware of Dave Stewart's work mm-hmm. uh, so, but uh, and his approach to particularly Hellboy and stuff like that, like well, I think it's most comics at this stage. But uh, but um, yeah, like I like that kind of stuff. But when you look at the the Age of Apocalypse and stuff, it's 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 a real good example of how overindulgent ninety stuff was. Yeah, it absolutely is. It's um, what was the name of the coloring company that was like it was like a collective liquid? Mm, Do you I remember that? I don't know now. No, I'd be lying here if I said it. So there's there's a bunch of comics in sort of late nineties where the colorist like the color is done by liquid. Oh, because yes, because these are sort of they, they tag the images. Yeah. Yes, I never yeah. I never knew what that was about, and I, I kind of I know exactly the writing they had with the big Q and stuff, as far as I remember. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I never I thought that I did not know what that was. I also thought that was like the artist or the like you know this is going back you know you said this is going back years ago. I haven't seen that in forever. Yeah, uh, established in 1996, it was a uh, graphics firm that had colorists working for the comic book industry. It's interesting. Um, it's interesting. I, I mean, like Ultimate X Men and stuff would have had liquid colorists. Um, it's it's interesting that it seems to remove the actual. Uh, uh, accreditation like who's the fella who's the woman who's the person that's what I'm saying who colored yeah. it yeah. it's just the company took it yeah so, which, which is strange but they must have gotten paid pretty okay yeah yeah that's so funny though yeah but liquid I do like that's that's a kind of like no I mean like when you say they must have got paid pretty okay I would we- reckon I would reckon it's a um, oh, Jonathan was uh, I would reckon it was real shitty work for hire because this person knew how to use Photoshop. Fair, 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 you know? fair. Because, <laughs> like, when you think of Lynn Varley or you think of uh, Jordi Belair and um, Ruth Redmond, I think. When, like, you can you can name colorists. Michael Spicer that have the built best colorist going at the moment. That have built who? Michael Spicer. Michael Sp- Spicer, Mike, yeah. Michael Spicer, I think his name is. He's phenomenal. Yeah. So for those people who have established careers and reputations based on their work as colorists that actually put thought into how they're engaging with the artwork to be complete, like to have their names taken off the work and just have the word oh, no. liquid. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's not great. Yeah, it is terrible. Um, um, which I wasn't aware was a thing. But uh, yeah. But I don't know, maybe Liquid Graphics was doing idents for news shows at the same time and they just had some Photoshop guys with nothing to do. And they were like, Fair. we can get some extra work in. All right, well then. After, after Age of Apocalypse, now, uh, you know, kind of, we'll, we'll get on Age of Apocalypse, but I would be interested in reading Claremont's uh, collection, Second Genesis, and Jim Lee's Executioner Song. Okay, so that's where we're getting 
into bigger conversations around comics as well, though, because like as we're talking about Age of Apocalypse, like I did read Age of Apocalypse back in like 2006, mm-hmm. 2007. Mm-hmm. I bought a collected, I think, mm-hmm. bought a collected or borrowed a collected from like a college library or something. And uh, Age of Apocalypse, I have in my head a sort of era of like wheel spinning comic books at which point everything kind of resets and you know like i don't feel like it furthers anything much and age of apocalypse is one of those things because look spoilers at the end of the day it's a it was all a dream kind of narrative you know mm. we we get to the end of it and we reset and it was like a year's worth of comics that basically meant fucking nothing, nothing. Yeah, do you know what course. i mean yeah like, like whether or not like they've 90% dipped back into big it. comic book arcs but yeah yeah maybe it, like maybe. it's all about resetting a status quo eventually yeah, but maybe kind of bleep out anything that is spoilerish because we want to take people on this journey with us. Okay, but does that feel spoilerish? That it's all a dream. It's not all a dream. I know, but I'm it not gets saying reset. it's all a dream, no, but I'm saying, yeah, but it's it's not canon, basically. It's not canon. It's an else world. It's a what if. It's yeah. a parallel dimension. It's a yeah. could have been scenario, and I've said this since Shrek. <laughs> four or something i think it was the one where it's like he woke up talked to rumpelstiltskin had an adventure and ends up right back where he started and i went i i needn't why did i bother seeing this fucking film that's that's like ant-man 3 hold on i'm thinking about ant-man 3 you think that nothing i look nothing is going to beat for me chris's evaluation of and we should just i need to get chris back on this podcast because he his evaluation of ant-man 3 um sums up big action movies as well i've come to a movie where a guy gets small he turns into an ant and he uses that power in interesting ways and if you think about the first ant-man movie like he's he's using the technology to do things with scale that are fun you know yeah yeah by the end of ant-man 3 it's two men punching each other in the head it's like i didn't i didn't yeah. come to see rocky you know yeah. what i mean i think i think the, um, the, 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 i think the only thing we got from ant-man 3 is cassie lane or cassie lang that's the only thing which is not a bad thing. Yeah. I'm just saying that's 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 the purpose of the movie was to introduce her as a character, essentially. Well, this is um, this is shitty, and then um, let's not get down that. <laughs> so um, that's just going to bring me back to Marvel spinning its fucking wheels. Uh, yeah, I, I, but I, okay. I, I, I've subscribed. I'll show up. I'll do whatever. You know, it is. Yeah. It is. I look forward yeah. to more. Um, you know, so it's fine. I'm Stockholm syndromed in at this point. Um, exactly. Quick thing, I guess, is uh, I watched The Diplomat on Netflix, okay, which very good. is uh, Kerry Russell, Rufus Sewell, a bunch of other people. Um, she is a uh, she's a diplomat who thinks she's getting an ambassadorial post to the Middle East, but something comes up and they send her to London, and it's a much more ceremonial, look pretty in a dress at a, an event kind of posting. A lot mm-hmm. of pomp and ceremony around meeting with royals and prime ministers and stuff. It's got some West Wing heritage in the creators, so I was interested in it because I love the West Wing a lot. I love Kerry Russell. I love uh, Rufus Sewell. Um, so I watched it, and I watched the whole thing. Uh, it's fine. I wish it were better. It's on Netflix there. Um, check it out. It has its moments. As somebody who loves the West Wing, that's kind of what I wanted it yeah. to be. But it's got it's trying to like shoehorn in a lot of like twenty four, with a little bit of like desperate housewivesy love triangle stuff going on. And the thing is, like, if you watch The West Wing, there are similar subplots happening amongst these West Wing characters, but it's split across a pretty huge cast. Mm-hmm. But so much of these things are layered directly onto Kerry Russell and it's like she can't do all of these things she can't like you can't have this character so expertly handling Everything. global politics one moment and the next moment not being able to not spill coffee on herself so it's Superman what are you saying that what Superman's too powerful it's inconsistent and you're saying that she's Superman's too powerful. It's inconsistent. Uh, I think that more so that they're just trying to do too much. You know, if you're going to have a goofy character, have the goofy character. If you're going to have the serious narrative, to have the serious narrative. Don't have in the same three minutes her be uh, super doofusy. Super. It, it's just it's just rubber band whipping between kind of. Uh, 
yeah, it's just an existence for the character. It's yeah. in existence, yeah. It's like kind of decide decide what kind of TV show you want to do here. What kind of what, what basically, kind of, yeah. basically, yeah. yeah. You're trying to appeal to everybody. You're trying to appeal to people that want twenty four, which is a spy and espionage thing, and then you're trying to appeal to so, something that wants like the thick of it, you know, the pomp and ser- yeah, the the thick of it is a great example. Yeah. The thick of it. There are scenes in this that are pure, ridiculous British politics. Thick of it. Well, so, so, the very, <laughs> somebody basically went off and created the thick of it for twenty four. Thick of it twenty four West Wing. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah. It's there's too much going on. Pick one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I yeah. I understand the instincts in some ways, but it's just not doing. It's not doing any of them great. Well, I I, I can't I can't remember who said it. It was like I'm sure I I, I think I remember Eric, hearing Eric Powell say it. But I, I'm not going to pretend to say coin him with saying it. But uh, it was just basically like, uh, you know, if you want to create something, just take three things you like and mash them together. There's your new thing, mm-hmm. you know. But it's mm-hmm. just like that doesn't always work. Yeah. Sometimes it's take three things you like, mash them together, and then take two things out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fair. Um, the other thing I started watching is Fubar, the the Schwarzenegger show on Netflix. Thumbs I don't up. know if you've watched any of it. Well, I want to watch it. Tons up, thumbs down. So far, uh, so far, realistically, it is thumbs down based on what you love about Arnold Schwarzenegger, what you loved about Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm. It's TV spy content. He's an old man now, so. He is, he is. And it's a bit of fun, I guess, but there's a scene and it's in the trailer where he's like, again, the concept is in the trailer. It's true lies, uh, Cross generationally, even like though his daughter's a, also a spy. Even though there's True Lies, a TV show on Disney Plus, I think. But go on. Yeah, I knew that was getting made. I think it got made for like Hulu or FX or something. Mm. Is it actually on Disney Plus? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. See, I think that just died a death and nobody watched it. But the first film, the film's amazing great for its time. Yeah, great first um, time. Jamie Lee Curtis, Tia Carreri, yeah, uh, Schwarzenegger, Eliza Dushku, um. I'm trying to think of the guy who played the car salesman. Uh, uh, he passed away. It's D P. His surname is P. I think. He's in Aliens. Yeah, is it not like? And the Edge of Tomorrow. It's not Chris Dylan. Something Dylan. No. I'll check it because I feel like an asshole. Um. Was a C P. Hold on. Uh, aliens. What is it? Palmer was not. Bill Paxson. Bill Paxson. I knew it was P. I knew you it was were close to the P. Yeah. 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 Um, Bill Paxson. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so look. Schwarzenegger's doing his thing. Um, it is kind of sad seeing him. I don't know. It like he's he's having his. There are moments where it's fine, and then there are moments where it's like, oh, we used to shoot him with a little low angle to make him look bigger, and oh, now it's just like a flat TV shot where he's like, "What are you doing? I taught you to be a nice woman and not to swear and to drink and look at this garish lipstick. Oh my god, it's a vibrator! Ah, vibrators! Ah, my daughter!" And that scene goes on for ages. That scene goes on for so long. Wow, that was very good. And he's just like but trying yeah. to turn off a vibrator, and I'm like, oh god. Foul. Disgusting. This um, disgusting. Um. So yeah, not but he's not the barbarian anymore. He's not. He's not Miss Olympia. He, he's an old man at a flat angle, struggling with a woman's vibrator. Speaking of, Al Pacino is expecting a new child with his a new young child. girlfriend. He's expecting <laughs> yes. a child with uh, his twenty-nine-year-old. Uh, girlfriend. girlfriend, obviously Noor Al Falala, Alf- Noor Al, obviously following Noor uh, Al Fala, but following following his friend and colleague uh, Robert De Niro, who just had his seventh baby. Wow, a week ago or two, yeah. What yeah. is it about the sex appeal of these eighty-three-year-old men? Oh, you know what? Put me in a room with one of them, I'd get pregnant too. <laughs> 